Hello, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Biet Simkin. I'm founder of Center of the Cyclone. It's a series of meditation techniques that I've anthologized. I did not create this wheel. People have been meditating since the beginning of time. If you're here, it's probably because you either already meditate all the time and you just are so jazzed about it, you want to spend another hour hearing about it, or you are looking to meditate more and you're looking for different ways to do so. So either way, thank you for, for being here today. I can't do this without you. I can't do anything without you. We're all together on this journey. I think there was the question of how did I go from sex, drugs, and rock and roll to meditation. And I guess the, the quick answer for that is that um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll are a form of meditation. And I use them, and oh boy, did I use them well. The reason that I took that path, it was because I was looking for annihilation. I wanted to annihilate myself. I didn't know then, when I was doing that, that there was a self that I needed to annihilate or why I needed to annihilate myself. I just knew that I had a desperate need to annihilate that, that raging voice in my head that told me, I don't know, what, what does it tell you? That you're no good, that nothing will ever work, that you may as well give up now, um, that you don't fit in, that nobody likes you, whatever, right, that voice? And so I was like, all right, well, I'll just numb this out. I'll annihilate it. And it really did work. Anyone who's ever tried sex, drugs, and rock and roll knows that it does, in fact, work. The problem with that technique is that it results in massive hangovers and that it doesn't result in, like, there's no longevity. There's the story of Hansel and Gretel. And the story is that they need to find their way back, and so they leave breadcrumbs. And when you do the rock and roll path of, you know, boozing it up or whatever, how do you find your way back to a place you didn't get to, right? So if I, like, pop a pill and, like, the next minute I literally have the experience of enlightenment, which is often what happens if you take the right pill, um, how do I get back there? What about a week later when I'm depressed or two weeks later when I'm confused or three weeks later when I don't know how to follow my life's journey? Like, what do I do then? So... Many years ago, I decided I was going to try a different technique, and that technique was going to be a lot more arduous. Like, well, it wasn't really arduous, but it was more, there was, it wasn't just a pill I was going to pop. I, I started meditating. And meditation isn't like, it's not an instant fix. You begin doing it, and as many of you have tried, I, I'm imagining, you have this sense of like, I don't know if I'm doing it right, or I'm still thinking about things, like I'm thinking about money or success or power or whatever, whatever our brains normally go to focus on. And after many years of doing it, over and over and over, I found that there was a correlation to those things. Like I could enter into the world a little bit more and a little bit more. So um, I wanted to talk about why we can meditate in the regular world. I live in New York City. I don't know, I'm sure everyone here is from very, very different places. But wherever you're from, you're not an Eskimo. You're not like hiding on a mountain, staring at a sunset 24 hours a day, right? Nobody's doing that. We all like work for a living, blah, 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 right? We need to meditate inside of that world. And so one of the tools that I use for that is called divided attention. Again, this is not a technique that I've created. It is a technique that was passed down to me from many teachers. But divided attention is a tool of meditation that doesn't require a meditation pillow. It doesn't require you to go to the Himalayas. It doesn't require anything at all. You could be right here in a bar. We're actually in a bar. How apropos, right? And they told me that I was going to be giving this speech in a bar. I was like, that's perfect. <laughs> so confusing. <laughs> um, because you want to learn how to meditate when you're like on a date with someone that you really like. You want to be able to meditate in those moments. You want to learn how to meditate so that when you're about to get up on a stage and speak to a bunch of people you've never seen before, you want to know how to meditate in those moments. I, I can't leave this stage and be like, all right, I'll see you later because I got to go sit on a meditation pillow for a minute. I'm feeling kind of nervous, you know? I had to find a way to meditate while I lived my life. And divided attention is a tool that allows you to do that. So we're all going to just take a moment. It's a moment of silence, so to speak. And that's not for, not, not for the gazing. But just, just a moment. Just sit for a second. Try to take in the room.
Try to stop time. If you've ever fallen in love, you will remember, or maybe you're doing it right now, that literally time changes. How is that possible? Like, how is it possible that you fall in love and all of a sudden, A, you're capable of anything, you're literally a superhero for like at least three months, and then um, after that, uh, just during those romantic moments, you know, like you're on a date with that person, you're with them, it could be like 50 hours of like, then we made toast. <sighs> and then we listened to a record, and then we sat for hours talking about nothing. You know what I mean? So that kind of feeling, I think that the gods, and I, you know, I'm not a religious person, but I, I say the gods and I, I study everything. And I think the gods gave us falling in love to show us what it feels like to become awake. Because always I remember every time I ever fell in love, I would be like, there's something to this. There's something happening here that's more than just this person or this relationship. I knew, like, my, mechanically, I thought it was them. So, of course, if there was a breakup that followed, which many times there was, and when that happened, I would be like, oh, it's being taken from me. And at that moment, once the breakup really ended, I was able to realize that, no, in fact, they weren't the point of this whole exercise. The person with whom I was in love with was a mirror for me to remember who I really am. And when we use divided attention, we're able to, in a sense, fall in love with ourselves. My whole life, I felt trapped inside my body. I hate, not only did I hate my body, not my body specifically, I just hated that I was in a body. Like, I was in a machine that was dying. And it bothered me, because I felt, well, I'm this infinite spiritual being. Which, but not really, right? Because, like, I had to go to the doctor and I had to like go to school, and it all seemed so jarring, you know? Life in a body. But when we use divided attention, we're able to see ourselves from this higher plane and start to merge these two pieces together. Because I think the machine, I call the body and the mind the machine. I think the machine and the soul are very different, right? The machine is like this tough, angry, resentful, frustrated thing. And it also, it needs to like do yoga just to even get to a place where it's sort of calm, right? The soul isn't like that. You know, what the, one of the best things one of my teachers ever told me, um, I was going through it, like I was having a really bad day or a bad week or whatever. And he turned to me and he said, you know what's great about this moment? And I was like, what? And he's like, your soul doesn't give a shit right now about what you're going through. And I was like, Really? Like, that's so true. My soul doesn't care. My soul is okay. My soul is okay. Like, my soul is okay no matter what. No matter what is happening to me. Then I was like, how can I get in touch with the part of myself that's that neutral all the time and not be constantly swayed by likes and dislikes, yeses and nos? You know what I mean? Like, our machines are so, I like that. I don't like that. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. I hate that. I hate when she says that. Why did she say that to me? I love that. I hate that. And I feel like we're in this whiplash of like constantly being thwarted back and forth by our machine's you know, reaction to reality. So what does our soul say? I've done some investigating and, and experienced it. And again, uh, meditation is not something someone can hand down to you. I can say that I've had various experiences that I feel you guys feeling me have had. Because when someone has had certain experiences, we evoke in someone else a reflection of their own experience. You know what I mean? So I know that, but I can't transmit this. You all have to find it for yourself. And one thing that I found is that my soul is completely cool all the time. It just is, it doesn't care. I lost something that I really wanted I, I refer to my soul, I'm like, soul, how you doing? My soul's like, I don't care. Still don't care. Still don't care about this reality that you think is so real. I'm still not attached. 
but I do a lot of studies of esoteric readings of biblical stories. And uh, one thing that I love is that I'm, I'm a Western person, and so I'm moved by these stories. I've read them my whole life. And so one thing that I remember hearing was the pearls before swine. Have you guys heard that story, the pearls before swine? And so this is a Jesus story, and there's an author named Maurice Nickel who wrote a book called The New Man. And he talks about pearls before swine. Now, I always thought pearls before swine was a, a metaphor for, like, don't put your gems in front of people who are going to squash them. Right? Like, don't be like, I'm going to do this big thing in front of someone who you know is going to be like, you could never do that. Right? That's a pearls before swine kind of situation. But what this um, story explained to me was that pearls before swine is actually about not putting your own higher self in front of your own lower self for judgment. You know? I don't want to ruin Whiplash for anyone. Has anyone seen Whiplash? The, the film that was just, Yeah. Well, I'll try not to ruin it for you, but the point is, is that it's a story about this jazz drummer who's so moved to become a jazz drummer, but he keeps, he has this wickedly intense, um, you know, kind of, I don't know what the word is, very, very mean teacher who just really rails on him. Like, he's so, 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 so mean. And the film, at the end, like, he finally, whatever, goes through some overcoming process, and he's able to become who he really is, like one of the best jazz drummers in the world or whatever. And there comes a point when the relationship with this horribly mean teacher just dissipates. He's like not listening to him anymore. And I think that's what it is when our higher self stops listening to that lower self. Because the lower self is never going to stop telling you that you're a loser. It's always going to tell you, you are a failure. There's someone else better. You can have more. You could get more. You're not doing good enough. And so how do we stop listening? I mean, the short answer is meditation, right? <laughs> it sounds so simple. But uh, when we meditate, we're able to enter into a conversation with our higher self so often that the voices become very easily discernible. It was explained to me a long time ago that it's really easy to discern what is the higher self and what is the lower self. Because I asked one of my teachers, I said, well, how do you know? How do you know which one is which? They're both talking to me. They're both like, one's like, you're so amazing. You're so hot. Everyone wants you. And then the other voice is like, they hate you. And you're fat. And so I was like, how do you know? How do you know which one is real? And she said to me, she said, well, it's really easy. Listen to the volume and the speed at which they come. She goes, which, one, which one's loudest and first? And I was like, the loudest and first is like, is the negative one. The one that's like, you're gonna fail, you're gonna fail, you're gonna fail. And then if I can just quiet down just a little bit, there's this little voice, and it's sort of like angelic and sweet, and very, very, she almost sounds weak. That's her mask. She's like, I think it's gonna be okay. I think you're gonna be all right. I'm not saying for sure, but probably. <laughs> it seems like it's gonna work out in your favor. And so like, I started realizing that she was my love. The one that, she was just so tiny and so sweet. She barely had a voice at all. But this loud monster that was like, you're going to fail. You'll die. I'll kick you. That one, that's my ego, right? And so I started to discern. I mean, I still hear that voice every day. And now, I mean, now it's just a fun little game. I'm like, oh, welcome, little friend. I love you, you asshole. <laughs> but it's a friend. It's a friend because nothing has made me stronger than that teacher. Because I listened. Oh, I mean, I was servant of that voice for so long and just was like obedient to the gods of my ego. So anyway, um, I'm going to take you through a divided attention tool technique to show you your own, you'll have your own experience. Again, nothing that I'm saying should be taken as fact. Um, I think all teachers that I've ever respected have always said, don't listen to me. I know nothing. So I follow in their lead and say the same thing. Listen to your own higher self. If you tell a big story, and that's going to be 
become kind of a theme here today. If you tell a big story, eventually that story starts to kind of fill itself out. So in 2012, in the spring, we started having people show up in these workouts that we hosted. Right here is our very first member, a woman named Sarah Wild. She's super fast. 